there's not too much there in your course. So it'll be. Uh, I think Sudhir sir has taught you a class. Yes, sir. Fundamental. Uh, what all did he cover? Fundamental of computers. Okay. So I think uh, he has taught till generations of computers. Is yes, it? sir. Okay. So after generation of computers, let us come to some uh, come to another topic, which is operating systems. And application programs. Okay. So first of all, what are operating systems? What do you know about operating systems? Which operating systems which uh, are there which you have used till date? DOS. DOS. How many of you have used DOS? Windows. Okay. And uh, Windows, 13. all of you must have used it. Yes. What is the current version of Windows which is being used Windows these days? 11. Windows 11, most of the people are using. Yes. Okay. Windows 13 is also there. Windows 13 is also there, right? So, as far as operating systems are concerned, there are two basic types of operating systems. One is the character based operating system, and the other is the graphical user interface based system. What is the difference between the two? Which kind of an operating system is DOS, or which we call the disk operating system? So character based. It is character based. Character Why do we call it that it is character based? Why do we say that? Because we have to do commands on it. Right. No. Because if you want to get anything done by an operating system which is character based, you need to remember certain commands. Okay? Whatever function you want to perform, that has to be performed through a set of commands. Now, it has become very easy these days when we are using a graphical user interface based system. Whatever we do, we do it through a pointing device. And which is that pointing device? Oh. It is the mouse. So, whichever part of the screen you want to take your cursor to, you can take it with the help of your mouse. You just have to use two buttons, which are the left click and the right click. Okay, so you can go to any portion of your screen through the mouse and you have a window for performing any task. Whatever is being done is being done through the use of windows. That is why we call it a graphical user interface. But that, not, that was not the case when we, when we were using character based systems. When we want to perform a task, a simple task such as we want to create a folder in a hard disk, we have to write a command. What is that command in DOS? Which is given by directory. Which is given by any We use the MD command, make directory command. Okay, so whenever we want to create a, a folder, we have to write MD space and the folder's name. name. Similarly, if you have, if you want to change directories, there is another command which is the CT command or the change directory command. Now, when we have to use commands for each and everything, it becomes very cumbersome because we have to remember each and every command. So, when operating systems which were using characters as input, they were being used, they were not becoming very popular because for a layman it is very difficult to remember all these commands. Okay, similarly, there was another uh, system which was character based which was called Unix. I don't think many people have Unix because Unix we use mainly engineering. लेकिन Unix भी एक इसी तरीके का operating system है जिसमें हम characters use करते हैं तो Unix तो थोड़ा और मुश्किल हो जाता है DOS से क्योंकि उसमें अलग-अलग modes होते हैं एक mode होता है जिसमें आप text enter कर सकते हैं दूसरा mode होता है जिसमें आप उस text को execute कर सकते हैं ठीक है तो ये जितने भी character based commands वाले जितने भी operating systems थे they were not gaining in popularity so in order to make them more popular a graphical user interface was added to these character based operating systems. So now, whatever operating systems we are using these days, they are a modified version of the character based operating systems. So you can divide the operating system into two parts. One part is the kernel of the operating system. Okay. First of all, we have a kernel. Then we have a graphical user interface which is added to this kernel and this interface is called the shell. Okay. So 
So there were certain programs which were added to these basic character based operating systems and they provided the shell of the operating system. After this there is a third layer and that layer is of user applications or which we also call application programs. Okay. So this formed the third layer. And on top of that, there was the user which was interacting with these application programs. Okay. Now, when we are talking about the kernel, this kernel operates on top of the hardware. Okay. So this is the kernel which is in direct touch with the hardware of the computer system. The kernel has an additional layer which is called the shell of the operating system. Then on top of the shell we install our application programs and then these are the application programs with which the users interact. So basically we can divide all the programs into two parts. First of all there are the system programs and then we have the application programs. Okay? We can divide all the softwares into two parts. There are the system programs and then there are the application programs. So operating systems can be called the system programs because these operating systems make the hardware functional. <coughs> Whatever function a hardware performs that is because there is a kernel which derives that function from that hardware, from that piece of hardware. And application programs are those which are designed to perform a particular task. Now what can be the task? This task can be text editing, it can be image editing, then this can be playing audio files, this could be playing video files, okay. So a lot many functions can be performed through these application programs. Now what does the system program do? The system program or which we often call the operating system performs another set of tasks. Now what are these tasks? System programs can perform various functions. The first function which can be performed is, it can perform CPU scheduling. Okay? <coughs> this is the first thing which can be done by a system program or the operating system. The first thing which, is done, which it does is CPU scheduling. Second thing which, we, uh, which operating systems do is DMA or which we call dynamic memory allocation. Okay. Third thing which is done by the operating system is device management. Okay. Then they perform communication management. Okay. These things are performed by the operating systems or which we also call the system programs. We will discuss each of them one by one. First of all, what is CPU scheduling? We know that a computer has only one processor. Okay? There is just one processor which a computer has. And this processor can be allocated to one process at a time. Hum chahe ki hum ekhi processor pe do processes ko chala le. That is not possible. We can run only one process at a time on a single processor. Now what has to be done is, this processor has to be systematically allocated between the various programs. Okay? Hum isko allocation karte hain. Allocation ka matlab, we assign our processor to a particular process when that process is running. Now what may happen is, one process 
मे वेट फॉर एन इनपुट और आउटपुट ओके इट मे स्टॉप फॉर अ वाइल बिकॉज इट इज वेटिंग फॉर एन आउटपुट फ्रॉम अनदर प्रोसेस विच मे बिकम इट्स इनपुट इन द फ्यूचर ऑल राइट सो प्रोसेसेस डू नॉट कीप ऑन रनिंग इन फाइनेटली प्रोसेसेस रन फॉर अ सर्टन अमाउंट ऑफ टाइम देन दे मे स्टॉप फॉर अनदर प्रोसेस टू कंप्लीट हुस आउटपुट मे बी द इनपुट ऑफ दिस पर्टिकुलर प्रोसेस ओके नाउ we have to do processor switching from one process to another process from time to time now this process of switching is being performed by the operating system it is the operating system which decides which uh, what processor time has to be allocated to which process so it may allot processor time to one process for a certain time period which may be in milliseconds it can be in microseconds then it may switch the process it may stop one process and then continue another process for a certain amount of time okay so whatever process uh, cpu scheduling is being done between the various processes that is being done by the operating system so the first work of an operating system is cpu scheduling another thing which the processor does is uh, which the operating system does is dynamic memory allocation now what is this dynamic memory allocation every hard disk has a format you must have heard about two formats first is the fat 32 format and there is another format which is called the ntfs format there are two formats in which a hard disk can be formatted now what is this fat 32 fat 32 format is a file allocation table the full form is file allocation table so whenever we read a book the first page of the book is always an index which contains the name of the chapters and the page number where the chapter begins okay all of you must have read books and the first page is always an index what is the use of that index whenever we want to find a certain chapter inside the book first of all we go to the index and find out where this particular chapter starts what is the page number similarly whenever we install any program inside a hard disk that program's location is stored in the fat32 file system it is also a kind of indexing ser service which exists inside the computer so if we have installed a software somewhere the operating system maintains the fat32 table where it stores the location of this particular software so if we compare it to the index of a book a fat32 file system is something like this if this is a fat32 file system what things are stored here first of all the name of the software then second thing is the memory location and the third thing is size these things are stored in the fat32 file system so whenever we install a new software that software's name is stored in the fat32 file index then its name is stored its location is stored now this location which is stored is in the form of a hexadecimal address we know that there are various number systems available what are these number systems we can use a decimal notation for a number we can use a binary notation we can use an octal notation and then there is a fourth which is called the hexadecimal notation what are these different notations like when we use a decimal notation we use numbers from 0 to 9 for creating any number it may be a small number it can be a very large number so whatever number is created is made from these digits from 0 to 9 then we have another system which is called the binary system where we use combinations of zeros and ones so when we are using a binary notation to represent a number we are using a sequence of zeros and ones to write that number there is a third notation which is called the octal notation where we use sequence of numbers from 0 to 7 
and then we have a hexadecimal notation where we use two things. First of all, we can use digits from 0 to 9 and then we can use alphabets from A to F. This is the hexadecimal way of writing a number or writing anything. Okay. So, when we are creating a FAT32 file system, we are, doing, we are using a hexadecimal notation to represent a memory address. Now, what is that hexadecimal notation? It is something written in hexadecimal format which starts with 0 and x. Okay, so we can write a hexadecimal address as abc 9 ef This would be a hexadecimal address. So when we create a FAT32 file system or whatever FAT32 file system is being created by the operating system, there is a memory address from where that software is stored. Like if this is a hard disk and this is a cross section of a hard disk, then every such rectangle may be, it can be a memory cell, okay? And each of these memory cells inside the hard disk will have a unique address which is a hexadecimal address. So when we are storing data inside a hard disk, this data may occupy number of memory cells, okay? So from which location the data is being stored? That location is stored in the FAT32 file system. So if there is a software which is being stored in the hard disk and it is occupying these many memory cells, so the uh, hexadecimal address of the first memory cell will be stored in the FAT32 file system. Now if this software is, let's say it is of 300 MBs, then 300 MBs will be stored here. Okay? So we will store two things. First is the memory location from which the data is stored, the first memory cell which is being occupied, and then the total size of the software. These two things make the FAT32 file system. Now, if we discuss the structure of our computer, Let's say that this is our hard disk, okay? Then this hard disk is connected to another memory which is called our RAM. Then there is a third level which is called the cache and at the fourth level we have our processor, okay? Now let's say that a user is working on a computer and he wants to access a particular software which is stored on the hard disk. What does he do? The first thing which he does is he double clicks on an icon. Okay. So let's say that this is our uh, monitor and on this monitor we have an icon here. Okay. The first thing which a user does is he double clicks on an icon. Now when he double clicks on the icon, this event generates a response from the operating system. The operating system comes to know that a particular user has double clicked on an icon. The first thing which the operating system does is it consults its FAT32 file system. It goes to its FAT32 file system and finds out that whatever icon has been double clicked, where is it stored? Okay, so it consults this table, it comes to know the name of the software and the memory location where this software is stored. Once it gets this memory location, what does it do? It takes the help of two wires. There are two wires which are present inside the computer. One is a memory bus or which we also call the address bus. There are two wires. First is the address bus and then there is second, there is a data bus. 
So once it gets the memory location of the software, what it does is it transfers that memory location to this hard disk. All right, the hard disk which is connected to the address bus. This hard disk comes to know what is the memory location of that particular software. Once it gets the memory location, what it does is it fetches that software from that memory location and it transfers that software to another bus which is called the data bus. So hard disk transfers this data through a data bus to the RAM. All right. The RAM gets this software from the hard disk. All right. Now, once the, once the RAM gets this data from the hard disk, what RAM does is it transfers this data to the cache. Okay. Now from cache, this data is passed on to the processor. Okay. This data gets transferred to the processor and now it is up to the processor to start executing this data. Now once this data is being executed by the processor or the software is being executed, the user may click on another icon. Let this be icon 1 and this be icon 2. Alright. Now Again, the whole process is repeated. The operating system consults its FAT32 file system. It gets to know the location of its software. It passes that location through the address bus to the hard disk. The hard disk fetches that software and it passes on the data to the data bus, which carries it to the RAM. And again, this page is transferred to cache and cache transferred it to the processor. Now, if the user keeps on clicking the icons, he may first click the first icon of one process, uh, one software, then he may click another icon, then he may click third icon. So, what is being done is, repetitively, new pages are being created. So, whatever portion of the software gets transferred from the hard disk to the RAM, that is actually called a page. Okay. So for every software that is being opened by the user, a new page is being created. So what happens is, inside this RAM, <coughs> a number of pages get stored. Okay, a number of pages get stored. So for every icon which is double clicked, a new page, page gets stored in the RAM. And whichever is the active application, there may be 10 open applications at the same time on a computer, but out of these only there is one, there is just one active window. So whatever window is the active window, that page gets transferred to the cache and cache transfers it to the processor. So whichever application is the active application, that is being processed by the processor. And at the same time, the other pages remain resident in the RAM. Alright. So we may open 20 applications at a time and our processor will be executing just one application because at that point of time, that is the active application while the other applications are in a dormant stage. Okay. Now, if the user keeps on opening application, we have... RAM which is of a limited capacity. Okay, we have a limited capacity RAM. Now these days, RAMs which we are using are 4 GB RAMs. Okay, so if the user keeps on opening application, there will be a point of time when this RAM gets filled. Okay, yes, sorry, RAM has Now, if this RAM gets filled after opening 20 application and the user opens a 21st application. What happens to the RAM? Now the role of the operating system starts again. What the operating system will do is, it will work in a which order? It will work in FIFO order. Okay. What it does is, those applications which have remained in the RAM for a very long time, but which have not been used, it transfers those applications 
back to the hard disk. Okay. So we don't need to worry about that we are going on opening applications, what will happen to the RAM. Because the <coughs> RAM is being looked after by the operating system. Once the operating system finds that the RAM is getting filled and the user is going on opening applications, what it will do is those applications which have been in the dormant stage for a, long, uh, for a longer period of time, it transfers those applications back to the hard disk. So what we feel is that as if our RAM is of a un infinite capacity, we never come across a situation where our RAM gets filled because we don't get such kind of messages. So what is happening is this memory location uh, or allocation is being done by the operating system. The operating system is, handled, is handling this task of dynamic memory allocation. All right. So this is what we mean when we say that the operating system performs the task of dynamic memory allocation. Now there is a third thing which is called the device management. All right. When we talk about the device management, these devices may be internal to a computer system or they may be external to a computer system. When we talk about the devices which are internal to a computer system, what are those devices? We can those devices can be a it can be a VGA card, it can be a RAM, it can be a hard disk. All these devices are internal to the computer system. But when we are talking about the devices which are external to a computer system, these would be any of the devices which may be they may be input devices or they may be output devices. Okay. When we are talking about device management related with the internal devices of the computer, we are talking about the device management of our hard disk, our RAM, our VGA card, it may be our LAN card, there may be a number of devices. Now when we talk about the device management, actually what we are talking about is, we are talking about how the processor time is being scheduled between the devices. We may be performing a number of tasks at the same time. We may be working on a file in which we are editing text. At the same time, we may be playing music. At the same time, we may be downloading a file from the internet. So the, a number of functions may, must be being performed at the same time. Now there is, since we know that the processor is just one, we have to divide the processor's time among the applications in such a way that none of the processes gets hindered. We don't want that any work is stopped. All the work is stopped. So what the operating system does is, it follows a scheme of multiplexing. Okay, it follows multiplexing. When we talk about multiplexing, we mean that we have just one physical resource and we are dividing that resource virtually amongst multiple people who need the same resource at the same time. So we follow a scheme which is called time division multiplexing. Okay. What we are doing is, we are doing time division multiplexing. Now time division multiplexing means to divide the time into smaller periods of time. We will divide our time into microseconds, that is 10 to the power minus 6 seconds. All right. Now, if we make a time slot of 5 microseconds, let's say <laughs> what the operating system does is it creates time slots of 10 to the power minus 6 seconds. So what it will do is if we are editing text, it may give 5 into 10 to the power minus 6 seconds of the processor time to MS Word. Okay. At the same time, if we are working on a file which is in MS Excel, it may, it may allot the next, next 5 microseconds to MS Excel. If at the same time we are playing music also, it may, it may allot the next 5 microseconds to our Windows Media Player. So what it is doing is, after every 5 microseconds, it is allotting the processor to a different process. So all the processes feel as if they are the only ones which are using the processor. But actually what is happening is the processor is being dynamically allocated to various processes 
and all of them are getting a chance to execute themselves. So we may have a number of processes which may be running at the same time with the help of just one processor. Okay. <coughs> so if all these processes are using various devices, one process may be using a keyboard, another process may be using a scanner, there may be a third process which may be using a speaker. So all these devices are getting processor time in the form of microseconds and if this slot is of microseconds, one uh, device which has a chance to use the processor at one point of time, within a, a few microseconds, it will get a second chance to use that processor once again. Okay, So like this can be a situation where in a class there are 20 people and these 20 people get a chance to write on the blackboard and these and these 20 people uh, get to use the same chalk if they have to use the same chalk to write on the key uh, on the blackboard every uh, every person who is sitting in the class will get a chance after others have gotten their chance so if there are uh, 20 people first person who gets the chance to write on the blackboard with a chalk will get a chance to write again after 19 into 5 microseconds all right so this is such a small period of time that you never feel that the processor is being divided into the various processes. Every process keeps on running and every process gets a chance to execute itself. Same is the case with devices also. Every device is getting a chance to execute its process on the operating uh, on the processor and the, pro uh, and the operating system is giving a chance to all the devices to get a chance of the uh, to get a chance to execute on the processor. Similarly, the operating system helps in communication management also. Now, how does communication take place? We have a model which is called the OSI model. Okay, open systems interconnection. Now, OSI model is something which talks about how the uh, data exchange will take between a computer and other computers. Now when one computer is on a network and it wants to communicate with other computers which are also on the network, this data communication helps with the help of data packets. Okay, like say if this is a network and there are nodes 1, 2, 3 and 4 which are there which are present on this network and these nodes want to send some messages to other computers which are there on this network. So these messages will be relayed in the form of packets. Okay, Whatever data communication is taking place is being done with the help of packets. Now what are these packets? <coughs> when we talk about packets, these are actually electric signals. Packets have a certain structure. They have a source IP, they have a destination IP, and third thing is they have a data part. Okay. So when there are computers on a network, each computer has a unique address, and this address is called the IP address. Okay. Now when one computer on a network wants to transfer data to other computer which is on the same network this data which is being transmitted from this computer is broken into small parts and these parts are called packets okay now the computer which is sending this data to the other computer on the network this computer has an ip address which is called the source ip address of the packet so whichever computer sends this data in the form of packets, it all it is also sending its source IP or its own IP. All right. Now the second computer which is going to get this data also has an IP address. So in the packet, that IP address is written in the form of destination IP address. 
then there is a data part which is in, in the form of zeros and ones. So whatever data is being transferred from one computer to the other computer, that is being transferred in the form of zeros and ones. Now the role of operating system is that operating system creates ports on the computer. Okay. Every computer has ports. Now what are these ports? Port is actually an interface through which data is transmitted from a computer and data is received on a computer. So if we talk about ports, at the back of your CPU, you must have seen that there are certain sockets. Okay, the back side of your CPU, there are certain sockets. And out of these sockets, there is one socket in which you plug in your LAN cable. Okay, you plug your LAN cable into one of these sockets. Alright, and you connect that LAN cable to your network. Now, what happens is if there is one process <coughs> which is trying to send data across a network to another computer, this process must be using your LAN cable to do so. Okay, but what happens if there is more than one process which is trying to communicate with some other computer on the network? This becomes a complex issue because you have just one port and there is just one cable connected to that port. So what maximum can happen is that one process at one point of time can send data from this computer to another computer on the network. But this becomes more complex if the processes keep on increasing. If there are a number of processes which are at the same time competing for that port to transmit data from this computer to another computer, it becomes a complex situation. Now how do we allot this port to the process? So what the operating system does is, it starts creating virtual ports. Okay. So there is one physical port. There is just one physical port, but the operating system starts creating virtual ports. What are these virtual ports? Virtual ports mean that with every process which, which is competing for the port, the operating system creates a virtual port. Okay. Now what happens is, if 10 processes at the same time are sending packets across the network to other computers, every such process has a particular virtual port associated with it. Okay. Now process P1 gets virtual port VP1. Process 2 gets virtual port VP2. Now there may be other processes on other computers which are getting data from these processes which are running on a particular computer. Now these other processes which are on other computers may again be sending responses to this computer. So they are sending responses to those processes on those virtual ports from which they are getting messages. So there may be a computer which may be having 100 virtual ports at the same time with 100 different processes attached to them and they may also be listening to traffic on the network from other computers on those same virtual ports. So this is like using a telephone, a telephone line for making multiple calls at the same time. Telephone lines mein kya hota? Telephone wire to ek hi hai. There is just one physical medium. But thousands of people at the same time are making telephone calls which are being, uh, which are being heard on the other end and people on the other end may also be speaking something which is being heard by a person who made the call. Same is the case with computers also. There are virtual ports and the same computer may be running thousands of processes at the same time which may be sending data from virtual ports and they may also be receiving data at virtual ports. So this process of port creation is being done by the operating system. So we can say that operating systems help in communication management also. They help in communication exchange with the other computers. Okay. So I think it is enough for one day. And uh, yes. So next in the rest.
Rest in the next class, okay?